Welcome to Keith Knight Don't Tread on Anyone. Today we have J.F. Garieppi. He is a biologist and author of The Revolutionary Phenotype. Mr. Garieppi, thank you for your time, sir. It's a pleasure to be here. I do enjoy watching your show and watching you answer Super Chats. I'm curious, why do you think that the left and the right disagree on so many things that are sort of unrelated, like gun control and global warming and abortion and immigration. The right and the left disagree on those things, but those are so unrelated, you'd think there'd be some overlap. What do you think is the source of the disagreement? Yeah, I think that ultimately the main driver, the main ideological driver left is a non-confidence in nature, and that the main ideological driver of the right is a confidence in nature, which sometimes they will tell you it's a confidence in God, but really it's a confidence in nature. And ultimately, I think I can derive all preferences of all uh, uh, the political alignments on all of these separate questions based just on this. Uh, for instance, uh, guns. Um, in the end, the, the leftist is against guns uh, because they care. They, they, they think they can fix problems of society. And it shows their social engineering instincts there. They, they think that if you remove the gun, you remove the violence. And it's a, it's a very uh, leftist idea simply because it relates to our ability in terms of government intervention at changing the world. And the right winger doesn't believe you can change the world or believes that at least it, the, the government is not the right tool to change the world and that individual actions must be the ones that change the world. Now, uh, when you think of, uh, if you listen to the left, you'd hear they're always bashing guns, so they probably are anti-gun. However, when it comes to the state having guns, they love that monopoly and constantly are looking for more excuses to use it. Why do you think there are so many blatant double standards in ideologies that even the smartest intellectuals of the ideologies are either unwilling to admit exist or just don't care to uh, express or address? Well, <clears throat> I think that the left winger ultimately trusts the state, and so they think that the state is on our, on their side. Uh, that's until they get in a truly left wing society where they realize that the elites will use the state against them. But until they're there, they are all throughout the way toward a communist state. They think that it's going to solve problems. They think they're part of it because of democracy, which feeds a delusion in them because ultimately democracy uh, clearly as we see in the case of the u.s uh, doesn't seem to be a functional system uh, but that's their belief so they act according to their belief not according to fact uh, of course you you can confront a leftist in a debate around hey look your your social programs didn't work hey look you you, you want to solve poverty you send money to people and what do you end up 30 years later with more poor people, uh, but they won't listen to that kind of thing because they first they don't think intergenerationally. Uh, the, the best space you can bring a leftist in a debate, bring them into the intergenerational scale, they hate it because then the evolution starts kicking in. Then the people that you favor through social welfare, they will end up having babies that will be poor in turn, uh, but they don't want to hear this one. Uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe, a professor at University of Nevada, Las Vegas, said, what is true, just, and beautiful is not determined by popular vote. The masses everywhere are ignorant, short-sighted, motivated by envy, and easy to fool. Democratic politicians must appeal to these masses in order to be elected. Whoever is the best demagogue will win, almost by necessity then. Democracy will lead to the perversion of truth, justice, and beauty. What do you think about that and uh, your overall thoughts on democracy? Yeah, well, Hans Hermann Hope and most libertarians, they have this kind of moral realist tone to them. They think that there is such a thing as the truth and that the, that the ideology of libertarianism is the truth. I don't think that way. I'm a very special libertarian. I'm more of a pragmatic libertarian. I like liberty because I know it works. And I like responsibility because I know it works. But I don't think they come from a god or from the sky. Whereas Hans Hermann Hoppe believes this. I believe that all of the symptoms that he, uh, that he diagnoses from uh, democratic society are correct. But I don't believe it's because democracy is false or I, I just think that pragmatically democracy is ultimately a mob rule. And that like all mob rules, it is 
uh, it is going to end up oppressing individual liberties that would have made society better. Uh, I think it's just a technical aspect, whereas most libertarians, they think that there is some sort of truth in the nap. I don't. I, I think that the nap and the principles, the, the idea that my decisions should not hurt you, uh, or that they should not at least constrain you to a damage that you didn't consent to, that doesn't fall from the sky to me. That's a contract between men and for men. Now, when you look at uh, people like, even on the right, if you consider them right, people like the neocons or uh, major leftists that you disagree with, do you think uh, that the intellect or are they just motivated by, you know, uh, unjust uh, uh, ideas? Well, I think if you look into the neocon and the mainstream politicians that have been uh, directing the U.S. toward war for the last 20 years, uh, I don't think that they have much of an ideology. I think they will suss their stuff in ideology when needed. But in the end, they are of the, their funders and they are being put in power through these funds that are sending them enormous amounts of money. And in exchange, they make decisions that will lead to governmental spending in areas that will favor the corporations that produce whatever they need. So when you see them launch endless wars for which there is no reason and for which there is no interest for the American people, uh, that's what they're doing. They're essentially redirecting bunches of money to their friends or to the people who put them in power. Now, what do you think about just the average person who sort of turns into the news, says, all right, the left cares about the poor, I care about the poor, so I'm on the left. Is that, uh, they do they just have different values, or are they it, totally ignorant, and that what makes them wrong, or do you think there's just a uh, some sort of moral shortcoming? Well, I think that most people who vote, uh, maybe they are uninformed, but ultimately they have political preferences that are innate, and that that their genes just make them that way. So they want to save the world and uh, public discourse at CNN and in universities will encourage them into pursuing these delusions that the world can be fixed by governmental intervention. Uh, ultimately, the big elephant in the room is the mass of female vote that we have in society, which we didn't have a hundred years ago. This is probably the greatest change that has pushed the balance of uh, governmental intervention toward more and more leftism. This was the opening of a slide toward leftism, the simple fact that more than 50% of the population are females, and uh, due to their evolutionary history with respect to men, they have not evolved to perceive competitive interest and social contracts in the same way men do. Uh, to to men, to a group of men, the question is, okay, how do we organize a world in which each of us can have their family and survive and be self-sustainable? And ultimately, the men-to-men -men interaction is a competitive one, and it's one that if we look at old tribes that are representative of what humanity has gone through in the last 100,000 years, maybe, uh, males were the one uh, dealing with inter-tribe conflict, war, competition, and things of that nature. Uh, when you introduce the female vote, uh, you introduce a drive toward empathy. And it is my position that female empathy has probably evolved in a way that was overshooting empathy, which was perfect for a hundred years ago because they were overshooting empathy toward their children. But uh, in the, the today's world where you can have uh, people traveling, where you have uh, state agents caring for children in public school, this overshoot of empathy leads uh, to political decision making that is skewed toward the left in a way that is non-productive. Now, do you think that we basically are just you know, in society constantly rehashing the same old ideas and just fighting over different current events? Or do you think that there's genuinely new ideas with, you know, Antifa and Donald Trump and, you know, libertarianism, monarchy, that sort of thing? I think we're revisiting cycles of conflict. And so there has been a cycle of conflict between, um, say, a laissez-faire approach represented by the right and the more interventionist approach uh, uh, instantiated by the modern left. 
but it's a fight that happens in a different world every time. So the right winger uh, 75 years ago was fighting for taxes not to be 4%, but to, to switch towards 6% of the total wealth. The right winger today is fighting between 47% of taxes and 49% of taxes. But the, the fight is the same all, all, all the time. But we are falling down the slide of leftism and communism. Now, um, you wrote a book, The Revolutionary Phenotype. What is the thesis of that book? So the Revolutionary Phenotype is a warning uh, to humanity uh, concerning gene editing. And I found out a, a solution to a very old problem in biology, which hadn't been solved before, which is why do we have genetic layers? So the way our body works is that we give DNA to our children and DNA produces RNA and RNA produces protein and our body works with proteins. And this whole three-stage system had never been explained scientifically. Why did it appear that way? Uh, the revolutionary phenotype is the ultimate scientific theory on why life emerges with genetic layers, why new replicators emerge. And what I show essentially is that what happened 4 billion years ago that led to our current state, which is DNA-based being, uh, is uh, an addition of a genetic layer happening to an organism. This organism was very microscopic. It was not uh, probably not as complex as us, but we're about to redo it. We're about to engage in another cycle of phenotypic revolution. And we will be falling for what happened 4 billion years ago once again if we start playing with human babies. What I say is, I warn humanity, if humanity starts playing with modifications of genes in human babies, we will find ourselves with a central entity controlling who we become. We will stop evolving and that central entity will be what's evolving. Now that central entity may be a computer, it may be the medical system, whatever it is that encourages parents to make these genetic modification will come to be the, the selection unit. And what I warn people about is we became who we became because we were a DNA evolving species. If we commit these changes, we will be no more. We will be the slave, the entity that is being used by something else. And this means a lot of the features that you would call human, they will all disappear, including ego, creativity, intelligence. We will be farming ourselves down into a lesser state. Wow. So when you say changing the or, uh, you know, altering the genes of babies, do you mean people making different selections in who their mates are? Or do you actually mean going in and changing uh, the way babies operate? <clears throat> Sexual selection is fine. It's been going on for millions of years. And in large part, what we became, the, the level of complexity we've attained is due to sexual selection. So I'm totally fine with people choosing their mate and, and improving humanity that way. It's a form of natural eugenic, and it's okay, although I'm not for institutionalized eugenic. What I'm talking about, what, what is the danger, is if central authorities start recommending a CRISPR modification of DNA genes in babies. So for instance, a doctor would come and say, well, uh, we've uh, sequenced your DNA and the DNA of your sexual partner. Your baby is at a high likelihood of having Parkinson's disease early in his life, or maybe he's at high likelihood of some genetic disorder affecting organs A, B, C. Once we start playing with DNA that way, and once we start offering services that will modify sperm, egg, or the embryo itself, we are playing with evolution and we're ultimately pushing evolution away from us. Because evolution, Darwinian evolution, requires three ingredients, replication, mutation, and selection. Uh, once we don't select ourselves anymore, once we have this protective layer of activity happening in the medical system or in some computer, perhaps one day some AI will be doing these changes, uh, we are delegating our evolution to something else. And in biology, what that means, what I show in my book, is it means we don't evolve anymore. 
we are essentially getting farmed in the same way cows have been farmed for for many years and pigs and chicken we will be farmed into something else i've heard so many people disagree on evolution while not even agreeing on what the definition is so could you explain the definition of evolution so evolution is uh, a large uh, category potentially uh, of systems uh, of definitions that apply to systems that change through time so when we say evolution we just recognize that okay nature changes with time cows have not always been cows the way they are we have not always been the way we are as humans. We used to descend from apes. So evolution is the kind of agnostic statement that things change. But what we found is that within evolution and within biology, there are a couple of rules that are extremely important to the direction of these change. And the theory of natural selection by Charles Darwin is the, the bigger pillar of why things evolve. And then there are some other reasons which we could get into. But things evolve because of natural selection. And natural selection is the simple mathematical statement that if you get many copies of something, and if these things kind of vary a little bit through mutation, the best versions of that thing will survive and they will make babies. The worse version of that things will die and will therefore not make babies. And so the statement of natural selection is simply that it keeps favoring mathematically those individuals that produce a lot of baby and that survive for a long time to make even more babies. Do you think possible, um, you know, whether unintended or intended consequences of having something like a welfare state that in America alone is like $22 trillion since uh, the war on poverty in 1960s. Do you think there's actually a dysgenic uh, effect that happens or is it going to happen anyway and the welfare state's just in the background? Absolutely. I think that any, any sort of environment that favors certain behaviors or certain capacities will have detrimental effect on other capacities. There's always trade-offs. And so if we were uh, challenged with a tougher world to live, I think, for example, of North America a thousand years ago, populated by Native Americans who had to build their own uh, shelters, who had to defend their own tribe, who had to make their own babies, and who had to find through the different plants and animals around them ways to survive. This was a more challenging environment. And if you replace this environment within very short evolutionary time, which is what we've done, we've replaced this environment with uh, state welfare, doctors wanting to care for you no matter what, um, counselors, public schools instead of father, mother, education. Uh, all of this is an environment in which there is less challenge to the gene. Uh, take, for example, GPS as a specific example. GPS, it has been shown um, if you use GPS versus if you are a taxi driver who doesn't use GPS, you have parts of your brains that are uh, bigger when you don't use GPS. Uh, the hippocampus, for example, allowing you to map the city to know where you are in it. So the fact that we use GPS already has an effect on our body on single lives. But intergenerationally, also what it means is that people with absolutely no sense of spatial representation can go about in the world and be as efficient as someone who does. What that means is that for millions of years, humans have probably been evolving capacities to represent the space so they could walk in the forest, find where they were, and most importantly, find where they came from, to go back where they came from. Uh, we, we may evolve away that capacity. In the same way, uh, moles have evolved away their vision. Uh, you have certain animals that evolve essentially closed eyes because they don't need their eyes anymore. And if you dig into dirt all day, you, first, you don't really need the eyes. And secondly, it's even an handicap to have eyes because it's a seat for infection 
uh, if you keep uh, digging in dirt. So in the same way they have evolved their eyes away, we might evolve the parts of our brain that allow spatial representation. But that's just one little worry based on GPS. There's a thousand other things in this society that are being farmed away. For example, the ability to educate children. It used to be that if you there, there was no public school, and so the only way to make your children well-educated was to do it yourself. Uh, we are farming this away because we're delegating it now to agents of the state. And so people evolve with less and less genes of good parental care. That's very worrying. Now, there is a really big sort of um, divide in how you can prove something in uh, when it comes to the COVID science, for example. Someone like, you know, uh, Thomas E. Woods, uh, prof professor, uh, PhD from Columbia, will say, look, here's the infection rate and here's where the masks were. If you look at all these states and all these countries, there's no correlation between mask mandates and a decrease in infections or lockdowns. And the lockdowns are starving people in the third world and hurting people in the first world. So to which they respond, well, yeah, things got worse after the mask mandate. Thank God for the mask date mask mandate or they would have been even worse well uh you know the uh, welfare state actually doesn't solve poverty poverty was drastically decreasing till the 1960s and then has flatlined since well thank god for the welfare state or else people would be even more impoverished than they previously are so is there any that we could sort of square that circle of correlation causation using a scientific mind well you can for yourself but the fact is we are already overtaken by uh, public intellectuals and people who have high interest in governmental intervention, and they control the discourse. They control it down to uh, banning YouTube videos or keeping or adding labels to your YouTube videos. So it's not a, it's not a funny situation. Our our thinking process and our scientific process has been overtaken by essentially a communist Bolshevik type of revolution and we lost it and it's going to get worse. Um, I don't see it uh, improving because just like you said, the public health especially and medical fascism is using tactics of uh, self-reinforcing sets of belief. Just like you mentioned, uh, oh, the masks uh, didn't work, but wow, th that's good because it would have been worse if we had no mask. Uh, there is no one willing to answer this simple question in all these governmental affairists and medical fascists. None of them is just willing to answer the question, if, if, if what we do works, why is there still a pandemic? Hasn't, hasn't it been the goal all along to stop the pandemic? Well, at some point, they were telling us that it wasn't the goal. They were telling us the goal is to flatten the curve. Okay, well, we've flattened the curve and we are still under lockdown. Now what? Yeah, uh, we certainly also see a double standard. For example, I think it was in March when... Dr. Anthony Fauci, which, by the way, he's like one of the most powerful guys in the world for a couple months. He had a daily briefing with the president of America. And in March, he said, it's important that people, you know, stop obsessing over masks because they can actually be bad for you. If you're constantly touching your face, you can uh, bring the infection in. It's mostly, you know, washing your hands and gloves. He said that on 60 Minutes, one of the biggest shows in America. And to this day, he's still admired, even though they've done a total 180 on that very thing. You get other examples of, uh, you know, but everyone being terrified of the Sturgis motorcycle rally. Uh, why do you think there is just no standards for politicians with regard, uh, politicians or their cronies, with regard to them being verifiably wrong or just blatant liars? Were you lying to us then or are you lying to us now? Why is there no standards for these people from the masses? Well, uh, I think that the masses don't evolve to find the truth or to challenge the authority. The masses evolve to follow the social flow of the desires of the mob. And so this is more true to our genes than anything else, uh, because you would get into trouble throughout human history if you were to question authority. And so the genes slowly evolve away from this because they realize, all right, we make more babies when... We follow the, the leader like sheep, and this is the state in which we are. The nature of the evolution of intelligence is that every time intelligence evolves in one individual, 
and th this person creates great things or makes the world advance in some way, everyone else around them doesn't have to be intelligent. All they have to do is steal their, their invention, precisely because knowledge is tradable. The development of knowledge and the, the challenging of knowledge is not something that most people will ever evolve toward. In fact, we evolve away from it as soon as there's one intelligent guy showing up. So an invention is made. This guy has no way to rest restrict the use of this invention from other people. And so they drain his knowledge without having the brains to have come up with the idea in the first place. So this is the balance we're in. And I think we may have reached peak intelligence in our society. And it's all downhill from here. Now, do you think it's possible for people to change their minds? I mean, I like to say that I changed my mind, you know, but, you know, people like Scott Adams or Robert Cialdini will just say, no, 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 you changed it for other reasons, not on principle. You first change your mind and then later come up with fake justification. So, I mean, I used to, I really wanted Obama to win in 2012, and then I supported Romney after I was introduced to the uniqueness of the state. It claims the right to initiate violence against peaceful people, a right that no other organization has. And all the excuses for this are total nonsense, a fake social contract, a fake div divine right to rule. So I just became a libertarian. Um, I mean, is it possible to change people's minds? Well, people change like you did, and I was a leftist myself, too. But I don't think we change based on argument as the culture seems to want to make us believe. We change because our biology change. We change probably because our genes make us a little more communist when we're young and a little more conservative when we're old. We change perhaps because of the set of incentives that we have when we start having babies or planning a family and then we see the world more in the competitive lens. Uh, so I think there is change in life, but I think you can't induce it in the way most people think, which is through debate and persuasion. Essentially, change exists, but persuasion, not so much. When you look at how, you know, the popular opinion used to be monarchy is legitimate a couple hundred years ago, and now it's only democracy is legitimate. And, you know, the average person has no, you know, in for the switch or either of them, uh, either one of the ideologies in of uh, themselves. Do you think that large scale change only occurs because a few intellectuals are having a lot of power and able to conspire? No, I don't think uh, much happens through conspiracy in our world. That there is a constant flow of, uh, of taking power into the hands of the people. Now, it, that, it, by that I mean democracy. I don't mean people really be truly entitled to their own decision. But this kind of collectivization of decision making is what we see from monarchy to democracy. And it's been pushed further and further through time, for example, with uh, women voting, uh, eventually immigrants voting. So there's this push from 10 people decides to everyone's decide, but together. And I think that what, what we miss is the kind of fine resolution. I want people to be able to decide, but not for everyone, for themselves. And that's libertarianism. Libertarianism sh shows the or sees the flaw that is in this idea that collective decision necessarily lead to collective good. I think that collective decision is the most horrible thing and it's going to lead society into a crash. I believe that we're surfing on the wealth generated under a much less democratic system and a much more capitalistic one. Yeah, I never like look at the things I love in life and go, God, I really wish uh, the design of the iPad had been put up to a majority vote. Think of how much better. It's like, no, thank God it was a few people working really hard, able to make voluntary investments and exchanges while competing with uh, uh, other guys that, uh, that competitors had the option between. Why? How are they able to fool people into thinking that a vote between two crooks every four years is a morally justified way to run the world? I don't know how they were able to, but it worked. And most importantly, the people who were designing your iPhone, they were knowing that they would fail absolutely if no one wanted to buy their iPhone. 
And this is one of the greatest myths of the left. You hear it in Vouch, you hear it in all these people who, who want worker co-ops and stuff like this. They don't understand that capitalism is ultimately the, ulti it's the ultimate tool for binding big entities to the desire of people. Because if I don't go to the grocery store A and I go to B instead, B succeeds and A fails. So it's essentially a system that bounds a corporation to be serving me in the best way they possibly can. And instead, they, the leftist sees corporation as big enemies and manipulators, when in fact, the only places where corporations used, uh, let's say, unethical types of manipulation is in their interaction with the state to get those big contracts. And it is false to be perceiving the, the problem to lie with the corporation. The problem lies with the state being present to be uh, corrupted to send contracts to these big firms. It's incredible. Like the people voluntarily offering me jobs, products, and services are evil exploiters. The leftist who offers me nothing but uh, Bolshevik tyranny and Antifa burning down my street. Well, th those are my allies in the struggle, and I need to take and I need to be hand in hand with them. It's it, everything is the opposite with them. Um, that you really got into the heart of uh, the, the di difference between the ideas when you were talking to Vash about entitlement and how they sort of kind of, I don't know if they don't think it through, they just believe that because they exist, they are entitled to the labor of other people. So if food only comes about as the causal result of labor being performed, it means you're therefore entitled to the labor. Is there any way of getting in and saving some people from that predatory mindset of being so entitled to things that they have positive rights to education and housing and healthcare and clothing and food and water and internet? Well, I think that most of them are programmed with the Marxist belief profit is theft, and so you won't get them out of it. But you can explain to people that ultimately everything that's good in this society is what I own. And... Ultimately, my life works well, not because I have a guarantee from the government that they will do heart, heart surgery on me when I turn 60 and my heart fails. That really doesn't matter. What matters is the, the four walls I live in, everything that I own in there. And to that, they will often say, people like Vash, they will turn and say, oh, yeah, well, you can still have those private items in our communist world. Well, the fact is we can't quite, because if we have total justice as they demand, total equality, uh, that means that much of what someone could construct in a voluntary world will be split and divided across the population. And there will be no incentive in that world to, to put in the work to acquire these items. And this is why the commies always starve, because they love Antifa tearing stuff down, but they hate the producers in society, people offering us stuff voluntarily. It's just such a bizarre mindset that the producers are the evil parasites and that, you know, taking away the profit incentive or just how profit only applies to one part of the interaction also. I mean, it costs me a dollar in gasoline to drive to work and I make a hundred dollars a day at work. I'm profiting $99. I should be shot against the wall like a bourgeoisie. It's so ridiculous. Or if the business is losing money, as like 80% of businesses do, well, then I'm profiting and I'm exploiting him now because he's losing at my expense. It's a fucking voluntary interaction. They can't, they can't appreciate anything. Absolutely. And we, we are facing a war against private ownership of any kind. We're facing it with the laws being applied to people's land, with the anarchists destroying businesses, with the right to do business being impeded upon during the pandemic, and I, I suspect it will be lasting after it. Uh, it's a full-out war against any sort of property, any sort of voluntary interactions. Uh, they want to control it all. And it's uh, terrible in those Democrat states what's happening to businesses. You cannot operate anymore. I know. Do you uh, have like some go-to propaganda techniques that uh, you're able to think through or like really big propaganda ideas that are constantly used in the media that you would, you know, warn people to uh, be able to sort of intellectually think your way out of? 
Well, I do some of that work on my Twitter account. For example, there is Rashida, Rashida Talib, I believe that's how her name is pronounced. She's a Democrat uh, representative, and she's pushing right now for a law that's all disguised as, oh, this is to ensure racial equity and the access to cryptocurrencies. You read the first few paragraphs of this law, and so she wants to make sure that black people have access to cryptocurrency, which stuns me as not having been a problem at all. I've never heard of, in fact, you cannot be denied access to cryptocurrency based on the color of your skin because no one checks it. All you need to have to have a wallet is a, a, a password and a key. Uh, but still, okay, so this law, but then you read down the law and it's all about essentially denying uh, stable coins outside of the U.S. and making sure that the official stable coins like Facebook are the only one who succeed and making sure that the coins of Facebook are eventually uh, taken under control by the Fed. So what I say is uh, to, to leftists, to, if, if, if there is a way I could pull them out of their beliefs, but I don't think I can, is look at how your desire for equality is being used here for making a system that will give you less options and for ultimately uh, shutting down paths of your potential liberty to big controllers of money and controllers of social media. Because here you have clearly a case of a law that is being presented as racial equality, but is really uh, a tyranny being applied to the world of cryptocurrencies. It's incredible. I even cite uh, objective or, uh, I'm sorry, empirical evidence when talking about the costs of small businesses uh, having to deal with regulation. And it's according to the U.S. Small Business Bureau. So this is like a government agency who did some research and found out uh, corporations, 500 employees or more, pay about $7,700 per regulation uh, per employee, I'm sorry, per employee every year to comply with regulations. Small businesses, 20 employees or less, spend about 10500 So once you have that gap, the more regulations, the fewer small businesses, the fewer people achieving their dreams, the fewer places we as employees have to potentially work at, less options, less products, less services, higher prices, they couldn't care less. They could not care less if they tried about objective evidence. So... Uh, e even when you like take it from, I'm trying to help the downtrodden in the working class. That they're just so uninterested. It's it's incredible. Absolutely, and even in my field, YouTube producing, there's more and more rules, and they don't even come from the state. They come indirectly from the state. So you have uh, Democrat politicians. They make pressure on. Uh, Jack Dorsey and Susan Wojcicki, they asked for more censorship. And so I find myself doing a show every night. And the, the amount of liberty I had four years ago is not comparable to the amount of liberty I have today. There are, there's a dozen subjects in which I can't even touch upon. There's hundreds of words that I can't use. There's ways of phrasing things, even down to having a scientific opinion on COVID. I need to be ultra careful in, into how I phrase it, because there are various rules concerning local regulations, and I have to think about all possible local regulations, and I can't quite talk against them. It's, uh, it's becoming a, a, a labyrinth of rules. And so I want to point out here that the rules don't always come from the state. Sometimes they come from uh, private corporations that are in line with the leftist agenda. Exactly. Speaking of which, what are some alternative platforms that you're on that uh, people can find your work? It's always good to subscribe and just be there just in case you get canned. Like, you know, Molyneux, poor guy, went from like 950,000 subs to like a couple thousand. It's like people. These guys work really hard to create content, take 30 seconds to create a free account. Okay, well, there's opportunity cost, but a free account on Library, BitChute, and Minds just to subscribe. Uh, what are your alternative accounts? Well, I have the BitChute uh, backup of all my shows at JFG tonight, so it's at uh, bitchute.jfg.world. Terrific. Um, another big... Um, uh, double standard that we've seen sort of very, very recently. This was not the situation uh, when I was in high school six years ago. So here is a meme that I recently saw. It said, black privilege. 
is being able to take pride in your race without fear of persecution. Black privilege is others assuming your poverty is the result of racism, not laziness, or being able to blame your shortcomings on racism and evil deeds from a century ago, being wealthy without people thinking you just inherit it instead of working hard, committing crimes against other races without it being seen as racial, thus condemning your whole group, affirmative action, always a victim, even high crime areas in your race are the result of other people being racist to you in the past, having the media cover for your race, black on white crime, when you get killed by the police, there's a federal case made about it, riots ensue, mainstream media and politicians address it, whereas Kelly Thomas, Ryan Whitaker, Duncan Lemp, Tony Timpa, Daniel Schaefer, all killed by the police, innocent and on camera, no one knows who they are, openly advocating superiority in things like basketball or running without fear of being called racist, not having to fear offending minorities or majorities, having politicians openly pander to your interests to get the black vote, always <clears throat> asking others what they're doing for your group, etc., or and not constantly being vilified. Like the other day I just saw Bernie Sanders said, here's white unemployment, black and Latino unemployment to show whites bad oppressor, blacks good oppressed. When they left out the Asian unemployment, why would they do that? Or the Jewish unemployment? Okay, so I'm sorry that was a long, annoying way of me asking, why is there such a double standard uh, against whites? Oh, well, uh, it, I mean, we've seen this develop very fast in America and very, uh, very uh, late because this is what we've had in Canada since the 80s. And I would say that this has developed in the U.S. around the year uh, after the Bush years um, and progressively through the whole Obama era. Um, I think that the problem is we have... First, we have trusted our information systems to people who have an interest in, in uh, deferring or uh, disqualifying our own identity and pride and forming that of minorities. So we have uh, a public education system that is not invested in our genetic success. We have a political system that is not invested in the maintenance of current demographics. So it's partly through all these means, and we have a mediatic system that is not sympathetic to white people at all. So through the combination of all these delegations we've done to the fact that we don't control our information, our public media, we don't control our politics, and we don't control the education being done to our children, it has left us with, uh, all, essentially our children are being raised by uh, people who are very hostile to our interest and our children's interest. So I think that was the biggest problem. If we had maintained the vertical transfer of culture from parent to offspring, we wouldn't have been subject to such a, an evolutionary interference. And also sometimes it's, you know, important to just let the average, you know, minority or even women who think that, you know, the state's acting on their behalf to protect them or whatever, that the left is going to backstab you so quick when they don't need you. Just look at how Trump supporters are a bunch of dumb, evil, racist hicks when just like eight or ten years ago they were the working class who we are fighting for to improve their well-being. So they've gone from the working class who need to be helped to they're all a bunch of racists because they're no longer useful. So, I mean, when logic and morality and history and uh, evolutionary arguments don't work, sometimes you just got to let them know the reality is they are a second away from throwing you overboard, just like they did with these dumb hick Trump supporters who are just racist. Racist and Russia. That's the only reason you know trump is uh, anything there's no uh there's no real reason to uh to, to like him why do you think there is such a hatred for trump i mean i can tell you romney was not liked by the mainstream media so was john mccain and george bush and you know uh, everyone else who's a republican but it's nothing compared to trump why do you think trump is so uniquely hated by the left and the elites and the deep state that's a fascinating question. Uh, I think ultimately it, it, it is the fact that even when the Republicans had powers in those years, they were still serving elite interests, deep state interests, and what we call the swamp. And because Trump has went so much in an open fight against the swamp, although he didn't do much, I'm not satisfied by his handling of the swamp, but at least he claimed that he was going to fight them. And just that, 
was enough to to make to make all the moles come out of their o's and so they all tried to get a shot at him uh, from the FBI to CIA to CNN uh, they all tried to get a little chip from Trump to say we were there we did what we could and ultimately it's the response of an irre irrelevant system that uh, the population doesn't want anymore trying to grasp for the last bit of relevance and if they they did succeed if biden gets elected president as they claim will happen then they would have succeeded at taking back power yeah um one thing uh i, I was told not to talk to you by a number of people because of racism now my whole thing is uh, the, I bring this up because I want you to be able to address this uh, terrible slander. If you have, uh, if you have a belief that because of your race you therefore have the right to rule over others and own them as property, you're my enemy. That's evil. However, if you have an in-group preference, I see no difference between I'm an American. I have a preference for Americans over others versus I am a white advocate. I have a preference for my group or I'm an Englishman or I'm a Japanese person or Asian or, you know, Jewish is obviously the uh, I was raised Jewish and everything. And I saw a lot of in-group preference that I thought was totally peaceful and justified. It's just caring. It's just caring for your own family and caring about their priorities doesn't mean you want to murder and enslave all other families. It just means you just have a preference, and I don't see anything wrong with that. So, um, the, how do you respond to the claim that you are a racist and, uh, you know, uh, racial preferences are something terribly evil that need to be rooted out, uh, especially with the whites uh, more than anyone else? Yeah, well, we're faced with the left wanting to essentially call out game theoretic decision in a, because the left dreams of a world in which there is no more racism. They don't quite define it the way you do because you make this di distinction between preference ver in a free society versus imposition of will, which is the right distinction to do. But the left doesn't make it because I think deeply they know that most of what most of the problems they're fighting against, most of the equality they want to attain, is not attainable merely by leaving people free. I think that they know deep in their heart that uh, if you let people free in the dating sphere, for example, they will keep dating within their own race, and that's true for whites and it's true for blacks too. And so, but but they don't like this because they know that there is some kind of inequality of outcome that is inherent to the natural behavior of people that will sustain as long as people date within their own race, the, the races will be separate because they will not be mingled, there will be different salaries on each side, and ultimately they will live in different conditions. And the left has this conviction that they can fix this. That all it takes is each individual person from each race making choices in their dating, in their marriage, in their job that all of their choices need to be uh, tamed and enslaved to the great communistic project of equality of outcome. Uh, it won't work. That being said, as far as my position, uh, you know, I'm just a provocative guy and I've been faced with a rise of a very aggressive left. And my response to this has, never, has been to never kneel to them. And to me, just denying, j just being there, I'm not a racist. Please don't punish me. I'm not a racist. That is a form of kneeling, and it's a form of kneeling I don't do. And because I don't do it, I got into all these uh, these mainstream media articles about me and lots of hate group on the Internet just trying to, to present me as the leader of some kind of evil political project. Of course, it's all false, and the people who listen to me on an everyday basis know it's false. But you know, I, 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 have, I have a dozen arguments I could say that would prove to you I'm not a racist, but I'm not going to pull these arguments, because to me, it's the beginning of kneeling. Uh, the fact is, people in this society make decisions that are personal, that must be respected under the state of liberty that our state is supposed to defend. And this includes decision in the dating sphere, decision in who they employ, etc. And, and we, we must accept the world as it is. It is a world in which you won't have a complete mingling the way the left wants, simply because no one is interested in that full 
uh, equal mingling. You're going to have some mingling between the races, and as long as it's free, I'm not opposed to it. But I will stand and defend the right of individuals to make choices. And if you want, uh, if you want to, if you prefer dating people of a certain race, I take no issue with this. Of course, yeah. Um, who are some of the people that uh, you like? Uh, some of the authors that you liked reading that you credit with uh, giving you the level of intellect you have today? Well, I think that. I always come back to Richard Dawkins, although I have big political disagreements with him, and I think he's, unfortunately, he's not very refined on politics. He's just one more leftist liberal scientist. But as far as his writing on science, the selfish gene, the extended phenotype, this was massive stuff. And I like Steven Pinker in The Blank Slate, although I like him a little less in some of his uh, later books. Uh, those were scientific minds that were writing in a language that I could understand very young. Uh, and then I've been inspired by the geometry of Euclid, by uh, scientists like Steven Pinker, uh, Richard Dawkins. This is what I like reading. Now, uh, if you were talking to, you know, like the me of eight or nine years ago, when I was a leftist who could be saved, uh, what are some books or videos or people you would recommend to someone who's genuinely open-minded and all they have literally ever heard is left equals caring, right equals the elites wanting to violently dominate everyone? I've never quite read books about politics and left and right. So most of my political thinking is done on YouTube and I've been watching Stefan Moliner videos back in the days. I think he's gotten weaker and weaker and I think he performed very poorly in our debate. But other than this, uh, yeah, I, I learned from politics by the, develop the development of it and the YouTubing over it. But I don't read uh, Ayn Rand or stuff like this. Uh, it's too too far connected, too too far remote for me to care about. It's too well. Ayn Rand, in our case, it's too fictitious, and even political thinking, I find it not very intellectually stimulating. Perhaps because uh, scientific thinking is so much more powerful on uh, on its insight that it provides. Like you read a few pages of Richard Dawkins, and you're hit with truths that are that are widespread, that, that that apply to a broad aspect of your life. Whereas you read about politics, it's always a little argument about a little action of the state. I don't quite like it. And uh, the Dawkins book you recommend is The Selfish Gene or The God Delusion? Yeah, The Selfish Gene I recommend, and then The Extended Phenotype. I don't engage much with the, with the militant atheist aspect of Dawkins. I find it uh, much more uh, insightful on the world. But read The Selfish Gene and you will understand how a biologist sees the world and it's crazy. And you realize that if, as long as you're a species that makes babies, there's no way of escaping the theory of evolution. And once you connect all of this to political thinking, although Richard Dawkins himself would recommend against doing this, I've done it, and it helps you figure out the patterns in society that are self-reinforcing and that lead society toward the precipice. Ooh, a lot of interesting stuff. Why do you think so? it's amazing someone like Richard Dawkins can be so scientifically objective, yet when it comes to politics, he is like one of the dumbest people, along with Neil deGrasse Tyson. They just can't admit that they have an arena, which they are terrific at, but then they just haven't studied. Like, it's okay. You don't have to know how to build the car. You can specialize and then save money to buy a car from someone who knows how. Why is it that these people can't just admit they have a blind spot? I think it's part of the fact that there's probably a selection going on where you don't become a scientist by doing anything else than going to the university. And by doing so, you are engaged already with a state entity. So probably what's happening is that the IIQ uh, people who would have the temperament of not becoming a communist like Dawkins, they probably end up uh, in other professions and they don't end up being scientists. So probably it's an effect of the self-selection happening by universities where 
the only way to do science fundamentally is to be funded by the state or do like me. I mean, I'm opening a little branch where I'm publishing my own book. I'm doing my own thinking at home. Uh, this is rare. Normally, you have to beg the state for money if you want to run a lab in a university. So it self-selects already a bunch of people who will inevitably, even if they explore the hardest ID in the, in the, as part of their exploration of evolution, they will still end up being somewhat biased towards state entities. Um, could I get the background story on how you got money from Jeffrey Epstein? <laughs> Well, uh, it was at the very beginning of my YouTube career. So back then, I was a, uh, I was a surgeon um, in uh, monkeys. I was doing uh, brain surgery at Duke University on monkeys, and I was doing my experiments. and And we had uh, a young. Um, uh, well, I, I was already interested in internet stuff. I, I've always been a guy on the culture of the internet, but I wasn't a public person yet on the internet. And so there I was uh, doing my postdoc at Duke, and we had a student, um, and she came into my lab and worked under my direction, and she needed money because she didn't have quite of a salary. And sometimes you do have awards in labs that allow you to find $4,000 here and there. And that allows you to have the student at least do its internship, its internship while being having some sort of money to survive. But she didn't have access to these things. And so I thought, well, uh, let's make a public campaign where I start a show on the internet and you're going to be soliciting money to various people. And that way you can fund your uh, learning in the monkey lab. And I will train you at various stuff, experiments, surgery, uh, joystick playing between monkeys. And if you do these uh, public episodes as a show, uh, people will give money through crowdfunding. And perhaps we can get some uh, institutional grants. And as far as institutional grants go, we sent the email to every who were likely to support scientific adventures of that kind. And it turned out that Jeffrey Epstein uh, responded to my email and he, he said, where do I send the money? Oh, did you ever talk to him or have a conversation? No, never talked to him. The only words I ever got from him were, was where to send money. That, that was it. it was, there was no capital letter. There was no signing by him even. <laughs> It was his email address responding, where to send money. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a funny story. Um, and, okay. Uh, three weeks later, I got a $25,000 check from him. So it allowed me to start the YouTube channel. It was a, a show called Neuro TV where we were discussing and interviewing some of the top uh, scientists across universities across the U.S. Wow. Crazy stuff. Um, final question. Do you think that intellect and freedom sort of are inextricably linked? For example, if you hear that a big corporation, YouTube, Facebook, or even the state is censoring uh, communications or they are regulating you know, what people can say, the smart mind is going to go, oh my God, so much truth is so hard to find. And that's the truth that threatens the establishment. We got to get that out there. The average person might say, thank God for regulation keeping me safe, both in the commercial realm and in the intellectual realm. Whereas the smart person is going to say, oh my God, all the advances that we could have if we're free to exchange and trade ideas. The average person's like, I don't care. There's, I mean, wh what's there to talk about? There's, I mean, CNN and Fox pretty much cover everything there is to know. Um, so do you see an inextricable link between freedom uh, or desire for freedom and being intelligent? Uh, good question, because I think that a lot of intelligence today is attained through the education system, which is essentially a filter for uh, sheep-like behavior. In the end, when we do exams, when we test people on how many percentage of the answers can you get right, we're really recording the capacity of the brain at recording, the capacity of the brain at repeating what the professor says. And we're very rarely uh, rewarding in our university system and throughout the public school systems. Very rarely are we rewarding um, 
cooperation in team or creativity or stuff of that kind. So I would say, um, I think that in fact, some degree of intelligence is actually correlated with the opposite of what you say. It's correlated to sheep-like uh, introduction of what whatever the professor says. But I think there are these little geniuses and revolutionary spirits that spring here and there, the kind of description that Eric Weinstein would make of a of a uh, original thinker that is kind of assholey or uh, that doesn't want to submit to the system. I think they exist, but they probably don't represent a mass big enough of the population to tip the balance toward your suggested observation. And I think that it would be the contrary. You'll find that higher IQ on average leads to more sheep-like behavior. But there are these exceptions that make these big geniuses and these big advances in science. You, do you have time for one more question? Absolutely. Okay. I'm curious, someone who uh, does not live in America, if you see anything unique about America, I'm mainly referring to the founding documents like the Declaration of Independence saying, we hold truths to be self-evident. Truth is objective. All men are created equal, endowed by a creator, rights to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, the right to abolish government, freedom of speech, the right to bear arms. Um, do you see these as, you know, really unique things that were really good ideas for the 1770s? Or do you think it's just a bunch of nationalist nonsense that we'd buy into if we were born in Bangladesh? No, no, it's uh, those are very unique features. And that's the reason I have a flag of America in the back of uh, my studio. Uh, it's not that I'm American. It's that I totally identify with this culture of thinking that America is exceptional. And I think the things you listed, uh, there's some uh, meaning less in there, like uh, everyone created equal. I, I think it's being misinterpreted by the left in modern times. But certainly this idea of the First Amendment, free speech, and the Second Amendment, freedom to bear arms, those are the unique aspects of America that are not quite reproduced anywhere else, although you, you, you will have people arguing that there are equivalents, but the reality is the way they are framed in America and the way they are applied by the Supreme Court are quite unique. And yes, they are the ingredients of success of America, but America has also left some holes in its armors, and these holes are currently being exploited by the rise of leftism. And the thing is, although you have guaranteed these liberties, all of the liberties you have forgotten about are all the liberties that are now subject to the overtake of communists. So parental liberty wasn't mentioned in the Constitution, and it causes big problems in family courts and CPS services and in hospitals. Uh, medical liberty not mentioned in the, the constitution and now what do we have a rise of forced vaccination or at least highly socially pressured vaccination um so although the the, the fourth amendment is typically recognized as limiting the state's ability to do it still uh it, there are some rises a and also the third liberty that wasn't protected is size of government just overall and so you have a government that's growing. It's not involving, uh, it's not impeding on your liberty to speak, but it's taking up on every other aspect of your life. And so these three things are things that I would add to the American Constitution to make it quite almost perfect. Mr. Gary Eppie, thank you so much for your time, sir. Again, the book is The Revolutionary Phenotype. You'll see that uh, link to uh, Amazon in the description along with uh, Mr. Gary Eppie's channel. Thank you, sir, and thank you to everyone for watching Keith Knight. Don't tread on anyone. Thank you very much.